Well, what a round of football we have witnessed. Round six of the NRL. Dramas continue at the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Two golden point thrillers in the NRL across the weekend. Welcome Billy Slater. And it's all thanks to Ram Trucks Eats Everything Else for Breakfast. This is the Billy Slater Podcast. Morning, Billy. Yeah, morning, Pete. Oh, it's the game just keeps delivering and we've had two golden point thrillers. Uh, the excitement around the game and and the teams are never out of it. Doesn't matter how far you are behind and how much time's left on the clock. I thought it was a really exciting weekend of rugby league. But to be honest, what has overshadowed it and what has probably been the most drama and most exciting part of the weekend was last night's press conference between Des Hasler and Ricky Stewart. Um, I was actually travelling back from Sydney. I called the the Tigers-Dragons game and I was travelling back from Sydney, watched the game, and then I love watching the press conferences. Mm. It's it's probably my favourite part of the week, watching the coaches talk about their teams. And Des Hasler threw... The first punch um, with, you know, talking about the penalty count, uh, which it was extremely lopsided. Um, but watching the game live, I didn't I didn't think that was anything uh, un- out of the ordinary uh, mm. penalised or anything like that. And then Ricky Stewart, well, you know, once he heard the, the news that Des uh, had been questioning the penalty count and, well, he went to town, didn't he? You know what, Billy? When you have Hasler v Stewart in the coach's box, the, the press conference should be done like political debate style where we have the oh. worm as well voting. They can <laughs> each stand <laughs> either side of the room. There's it there's an end, idea. and a, yeah, It would end up like a weigh-in at the boxing where someone would That's have it. to get in between them and, and just keep them apart. So <laughs> two well-respected coaches, two, mm. two coaches that understand and know the game as, as good as anyone. Um, the one thing you do have when when you're a coach is is you have your team's lens on. You you, you look at the game um, from the perspective of of your your team, and um, sometimes when it sits right on the line, it, you sway towards you know the benefit of your team. So mm. you know I think that's where where this sort of war of words has sort of begun. Uh, both teams fought really hard, and, and that's the one thing that Des Hasler would be disappointed with or, or uh, frustrated with is because his team fought so hard, um, you know, and they gave so much and they're in a, a really tough spot and he would be really proud of the effort from his team, but they just couldn't quite get it done at the end. Just on that, uh, so much improved the last two weeks from the Titans, but Canberra, uh, they're playing really good footy, aren't they, uh, Billy, under uh, under Ricky, unearthed some Good, young, talented players. We saw Chevy Stewart debut last night. Ethan Strange had a great start of the year in the number six jersey and, and a good pack of forwards as well down in the nation's capital. How good's our game? Like, yeah. like the, the world was ending in Canberra when Jack Whiten left last year. It was like the Canberra Raiders might, must, might, they, they might as well not even turn up next year. You know, that, that was the feeling around it, um, the disappointment. And, you know, he's he's a great player, Jack Whiten. Um, but... But it, it comes with opportunity. You know, when a player leaves, there's an opportunity. I remember when Matt Orford left the Melbourne Storm. Matt Orford was a wonderful player. He's a premiership winning player. He went, went on to win a Dalian medal. Um, but when he decided to go to Manly, um, there was a lot, of, a lot of talk around, oh, well, you know, you know there's Melbourne's best player gone and he's play, their playmaker. All of a sudden, a bloke by the name of Cooper Cronk come and wore the number seven for Melbourne. And he did all right, didn't he? Yeah. Went on to win six grand finals. <laughs> He's, um, yeah, so when when there's disappointment with a player leaving your club, sometimes uh, it can be a blessing in disguise to give a young guy, look at Ethan Strange. He's, Ethan Strange has you know, basically won them the game um, last night with that run down the sideline, set up the field position, and then Jamal Fogarty, who's having um, having one of his best seasons so far, you know, controlling things, um, got some youth around him. And young Chevy Stewart, I thought he was courageous and, you know, really solid in his first game. Um, it would have been a great moment for the young man. But, yeah, they're a team. They're a tough team. They know their DNA. They know what works for them. Um, it's hard to to outlay that every week, as we saw a couple of weeks ago when they were disappointing. But, um, boy, they've they've turned it around again, and the last two weeks have been yeah, outstanding. And just on the Titans, they're at home this week. Big one for Des against Manly. 
Yeah, coming up against his old team. It, it's a big it's a big game for them. They're winless. You know, they're, they're winless uh, after six rounds in this competition and um, it's yeah, it's tough going for the Titans. Mm-hmm. Now on top of that, they lost their captain and their their most e- experienced and and real leader in their team in Tino Fasu Malawi. You know, it's it's just been a, a really tough season for them so far and you know, I thought they put in a whole heap of effort. They tried really hard yesterday and they just couldn't get over the line. Now, South Sydney Rabbitohs, Billy, and it appears uh, from the outside that a lot of the noise around, say, whether it be Mel Meninga being sounded out to be coach, and he can't because he's still the the the, the Australian coach, would have to get special dispensation from the ARLC. All that was done by external figures and no one from management or ownership uh, at the uh, at the club and. and uh, it looks like that, that JD is going to remain as coach. My question to you, Wanda, before we talk about specifically about Saturday night, is that why wasn't a lot of this said on Friday or Thursday of last week when there was uh, a lot of drums beating from around the club? Well, all this speculation will continue until South Sydney come out and make their decision on on who they want to lead their club. Mm. That that's what needs to happen. The the voice of South Sydney um, internally needs to come out and say what they want, and they need to work out what they want first. Um, if if that's Jason Demetrio, and and they want they think he is the best person to lead this football side forward, they they need to come out and express that, and and put all this to bed. If they don't, well, they need to make the decision, and and move on with it. Um, but. The, the noise is really loud. Look, I, talk about effort. <laughs> they tried really hard as well against Cronulla and um, they were dealt a few cruel blows. Um, you know, there were some senior players that, that went off the field that didn't come back on. Um, Junior Totola, he picked up an injury. He didn't play much part in the game. Cam Murray, you know, got a head knock in the first half. He didn't play any further part. And young Munro uh, on the wing. So, so it was a really tough night for South Sydney. I thought they fought hard. I thought Tom Burgess was good. Um, young Jai Gray, he spent some time on the sideline as well in his debut match with a with a head injury, and and then came back on the field. He was he was good as well. Um, but yeah, you know, they just need to work out what they want, who they think the best person for that job is, and and then come out and move forward with it. All right, they've got the bye this week, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Now, it was a weekend for Golden Point games. The, the way that the Warriors got a point out of this. If you turned off the TV or the radio with five minutes to go and you would have gone, oh, well, Manly, two points across the Tasman. Well done to them. But uh, remarkable ending to this one. Yeah, this was the game that I was most interested in over the weekend because they were both coming off really impressive wins. They were both the two form teams of the competition and and they didn't disappoint. They didn't disappoint one bit. Both of them played really well. Manly got out of the blocks, um, you know, to start the game, and they hit the scoreboard first. Um, but they just never give up the the Warriors. And the game at the moment, it doesn't matter how many points you are behind. It doesn't matter how much time there is left on the clock. The game is never done until that hooter goes. And the Warriors showed that. In particular, their number seven. He is a star. Um, you know, he set up. The try for Dallin Watini's Lesniak in the corner. And then he said, give me the ball. I'll put it on the tee and I'll put it straight between the uprights. So they were eight behind with less than 60 seconds to go. Yep. So they had to score twice with less than one minute to go. And the new rules around stopping the clock after tries in the last five minutes has, has brought more excitement into the game. He pushed it into extra time. Um and then it just showed the quality of the two teams that they just didn't give each other an opportunity to put that field goal over in extra time. So I'm happy with the draw. It was a, a thrilling game and um, they lived up to all expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Tremendous contest. You mentioned that you were uh, at Campbelltown yesterday, of course, for Channel 9's coverage. Uh, and well, a lot of the focus, and we'll talk about the Tigers' performance in just a moment, has been on, on them. The Dragons, uh, Billy tremendous, uh, including Zach Lomax, uh, who again had some just uh, amazing moments in that game yesterday. Yeah, he, he was the best player on the field. Zach, he 
he, he played to his strengths. He is great under the high ball, um, chasing kicks, and he's a really physical player. Uh, I, I thought he was tremendous. He's had a great season so far. And to play at this level and, and with this much quality in his game, with all the noise around him, it just shows you the mental toughness of the lad. And I actually ran into Zach in the car park going into the game. He was extremely relaxed. He, he's, he's, a, he's a really good person uh, from my dealings with him. And, you know, he was really relaxed. Obviously, it would be a weight lifted off his shoulders that that the speculation is done now. Um, he's going to Parramatta on a four-year deal, and um, that's all done. He's at the Dragons for the rest of the year. And the way that he's playing, I, I don't see any performance dip or anything like that. He, he was wonderful. And they're a really physical team. Um, you know, led by their outside backs. You think of, you know, Suli Ravalawa, um, Jack Bird, and and Zach Lomax. That's they're like four four forwards bringing it yeah. out of the backfield. And then you've got the speed and excitement of um, Terrell Sloan. Yeah, they they were they were good yesterday, and the Tigers just couldn't match it with them. Yeah, just on Zach Lomax, there was one catch in particular yesterday, Billy. I'm sure you know the one I'm going to refer to. It was. Almost behind fingertips. his head on the on his fingertips. Mm-hmm. I mean, he loses sight on it, but still manages to to keep control. I mean, you're a great person to ask her about this. You, you did that stuff with your eyes closed, but uh, but, but mate, the, that how, was tackling. I tackle with my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> how difficult is that to to do with with? Well, there would have been about half a dozen players around him as well. Yeah, and, and not to mention the way that he got rid of the ball after that and yeah. flicked it over his right shoulder. And, and Ben Hunt actually fumbled the ball, but um, it was right in his lap. It was right in front of him. Um, uh, he's he's just a wonderful athlete. He's a he's – a, and the first thing he does is he competes. Mm. You know, he runs 30, 30, 30, 25, 30 metres just to get to that contest, to get to the zone where the ball's going to drop into, and, and he competes on that. And then when he gets there – you know, he competes on on the ball. Um, he has he has eyes for the ball. You won't be seeing Zach Lomax be penalised for a, uh, what is it a disruptor? No. Nope. So because he goes for the football every time, he believes that he's going to come down with the football every time, and you know that's what you want in your team. And you know when your team's not going well, that's how you can turn the tide. Is is those efforts and competing for those kicks and. Um, yeah, you know, he he did he score a try. He set up a try uh, off one, and he just looks dangerous and most likely every time the ball goes in the air. Yeah, he sure does. Well, scored in the opening minute uh, yesterday. Mm. Uh, did uh, did Zach Lomax? Uh, you mentioned uh, buzzword. Boy, we can come up with some buzzwords uh, in the game. Disruptor, uh, Billy. Uh, we saw a couple of them over the weekend. Uh, players are just going to learn now. They've got to time your run, don't they? Well. We're going to be we're going to debate and argue what is a disruptor and what is a willing contest going for the football. We're going to debate that throughout the whole year. I think a lot of them, it's pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. There was there was one in the Tigers game where Api Corusau went through. I felt that was that was a worthy penalty. There was one in the Canberra game. Um, I can't remember the Titans player that went through. Might have been Khan that, Pereira, I think. It may yeah, have been that was a worthy yeah. penalty. Like yeah. when you're going through and you don't have eyes for the football and you jump in the zone you and, and you're interfering with um, the other person competing with the football, hmm. then then it's a penalty. I, I, I totally get that. But if you can get through and you and you go for the football and you have eyes for the football and it's a genuine attempt to – you don't have to catch it. I don't think there's a rule you have to catch it, but you have to go for the ball. If you can tap it back, um, so that's where the grey area is. Is um, you know the opinion of of whether you're genuinely going for the football and competing for it, or whether you're just there to try and make them make a, a mistake. Friday night at Suncorp Stadium, you were there for the Battle of Brisbane where the Broncos uh, got the job done over the Dolphins. Uh, look, it, it wasn't pretty, but uh, Brisbane gifted a number of tries uh, in that second half to to get them the win. But uh, while the game wasn't pretty, the occasion was great, wasn't it, with over 46,000 fans at Suncorp? And it was always going to be a little bit like that with the amount of injuries and experience out of out of both teams. Um, I think it was always going to be a little bit scrappy, and it was a tough contest in the first forty minutes. Um, we had two unlikely try scorers in 
in um, Jared Wallace and Xavier Willison. So two front rowers uh, hit the scoreboard and and we went in a try piece at half time and look, the floodgates opened a little bit and the, and the class prevailed uh, in the second half. And to be honest, I, I thought the Dolphins had a period in that second half where um, they they let go of the the contest. Um, they they didn't compete and they didn't build enough pressure on the Broncos to stay in the contest. And and then the stars they they shone. That Reese Walsh, Selwyn Cobo was was great. Um, so yeah, the the top line players really took over from there. But you mentioned the occasion. You know, forty six, forty seven thousand people at Suncorp Stadium. Um, it's the newest rivalry in our game and. It's building nicely. It means something to the players. It, it means a lot to the clubs. Uh, we heard Kevin Walters come out during the week saying, "Saying they're Redcliffe, we're, we're Brisbane. Um, so they probably don't like the Battle of Brisbane because they feel like they own Brisbane, the Broncos. Um, and they've been around a long time. You know, they've done a lot for the game, the Broncos. They're, they're a proud club and you know they're not going to give up their city um, just like that, just as another team comes in. So that battle is going to continue, I'm sure, over the, the coming years. Well, Brisbane marketed it as the game because it was the Broncos' home game as just the battle. Uh, and the battle. whenever a player or, as you said, Kevy or member of the, the Broncos staff, they said, yeah, big game against Redcliffe. I noticed even on Friday night, the ground announcer was saying, um, try for Redcliffe, uh, number 17, Jared Wallace. They, were, they don't want to well, say the not term even Dolphins. Redcliffe, are, they? are they called Redcliffe? No, it's just, just the Dolphins. The Dolphins. Just the Dolphins. But they are in Redcliffe. Mm. And they've got a proud history too. Don't worry about that. They might only be a year and a half old in our NRL competition. But the Redcliffe Dolphins have a very proud history. And I'm sure they would be acknowledging that as a club and as a team. And you got to lean on that. That's that's a part of who you are. That uh, that red and white. And I played, you know, coming through the grades, I played as a 17-year-old in the under-19 competition in Brisbane. And mm. The Redcliffe Dolphins, they beat us in the grand final by two points. I'll, I'll remember that for a long time. <laughs> you don't hold a grudge. <laughs> There's not no grudge. It's all experience there, Salty. Yes, it's all it's, experience. It's not that it's long ago, though. if you don't learn from it. That's it. Not that long ago, though, is it? Under 19? No, only a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, only 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about the Storm and the Bulldogs? Uh, is this more about how far the Bulldogs have come in, in your... Uh, analysis of this one, uh, Billy, the fact that they, they took the fight to Melbourne? Yeah, they're a, they're a really competitive team. They're, they're still finding ways to, to finish off games and, and just finish off um, parts of games as well. You know, they're still looking for that real top-end quality that we just spoke about with the Broncos. Um, but as t- in the term of, of team and work ethic and – you know, building habits in your game. Cameron Seraldo is doing a wonderful job there at the Bulldogs. And, you know, they were down, they were down, I think, 10 nil to the Melbourne Storm. Mm-hmm. The Melbourne Storm were, were right on early. They were right on their game. And that first half, they, they looked like they were playing really sharp. They looked like they were a, a level above where the Bulldogs were at with the football. And then they just fought hard, the Dogs, and a couple of Symbians, one, one for Ryan Pappenhausen and another one for Hughes in the – for the, for the Bulldogs, um, and they fought their way back. Josh Adokar picked up three tries, um, all the tries for the Bulldogs, went down that left-hand side, and um, it was the Melbourne Storm who had to fight back. You know, it was 14-10 to the Dogs, and it was a Sean Bloor try off a Cameron Munster pass, and you know, really happy for a guy like Sean. He you know, didn't really know his future throughout the preseason, and then you know they got the deal done with the Justin Olam switch, and... He's really found a home on that left-hand side outside Cameron Munster. So the more footy they played together, the better they're going to go. Just one um, person I want to talk to you about, Xavier Coates, again. That kick that he got away for the Pappenhausen try in traffic like that, uh, another great piece of skill. He's done some special things this year, hasn't he, Xavier? And uh, he is... He's probably the happiest person I've ever met. <laughs> if yep. you've ever met Xavier Coates, he's got this big smile on his face and, and he giggles and he just laughs and he's an infectious person. Um, but what he's done on the field, so for, for those listening that didn't watch the game, Xavier Coates, they, he he's, he's, loves the ball in the air. He's, got, he's a great athlete. He's about 108 kilos and he can jump as high as an Olympian. And 
you know, he, he didn't jump on this occasion. He stayed on the ground. The ball was a little bit away from the try line and he caught it. And then as they were pushing him into touch, he just put it on the boot and just bent it back in in the in goal. And Remus Smith came through and scored on it. Like he's done some special things this year and um, it all comes off his preseason. Craig Bellamy has spoken glowingly about how hard he worked in the preseason. Um, it was a bit of a lucky try. But the harder you work, Craig has always said, the luckier you get. And, you know, he certainly earned the way that he's playing at the moment. Okay, time now on the Billy Slater podcast for the Billy M Awards. Each week we get Billy's best team and player of the round. Billy, your most impressive team from round six. Boy, there's some big candidates here after some terrific football throughout the weekend. But who takes the cake for you? There are, Salty, and... I don't even know if I'm allowed to do this, but it's named after me, so I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to I'm going to give it a draw. Ah. The teams, the two teams that draw for the award this week are the Warriors and the Titans. The game is never dead and buried. Now the Warriors were down by eight points with less than sixty seconds to go, but the game was never down. Um, Sean Johnson pulled a rabbit out of the hat, and then for the Titans, they were in the exact same position, scored in the corner. Um, had a kick to level the game, and Brian Kelly in in only his second ever kick for a conversion in the NRL, he sinks it from the sideline um, down there in Canberra. It would have been a hostile environment, would have been getting all sorts of feedback from the crowd behind him, and he put it straight straight through the middle. They didn't end up getting the the points in the end, but um, the Warriors and the Titans for just hanging in there and you know, fighting right to the 80th minute. You know what? As you said, it's your award. You can do yeah. what you want. Yep. <laughs> you, you, it won't get written up in any newspaper columns about voting systems or anything like that. Okay. You'll, be, you'll be okay. okay. Uh, it's a draw, <laughs> half a point each. That's it. Most impressive player from your point of view in round six? Yeah, look, I've given it to key position players over the last few weeks, but um, this guy's a winger um, and – he just plays with all heart, and that's Ronaldo Mulatalo. Scored two tries and set up a couple, and we just spoke about Xavier Coates and some freakish moments. Well, Ronaldo's got that in his game as well. Um, doesn't just do it up there in in that part of the field. He, he does it out of the backfield as well. He'd be a, a valued member of the Cronulla Sharks down there in Cronulla, and he takes out the, the award this week. I thought he was outstanding, the player of the weekend. It's the sort of player, Billy, that you, you just get the impression when you, when, especially when he does anything, whether it be the scoring of tries, whether it be a, uh, a tackle, just a moment, the teammates get around him. Uh, he, obviously, he's the sort of player that uh, others really enjoy playing with. You can tell he loves what he does, doesn't he? Don't you? And you can see the gratitude that he has for the position he holds. And, and you see that in, in the off field stuff he does. But, you know, on the field, um, like I said before, like, his teammates would love playing with Ronaldo and he, he occasionally gets under the skin of, of opposition players, but, um, but that's just his personality. Um, everything that I've seen with Ronaldo off the field, he, he seems like a really good person. He does a lot of community work. Um, he's very open about his journey and, and, you know, the, the hardness that it's taken to get to where he is. Um, but on the field, he, he is a remarkable player and, I heard Phil Gould talk about Ronaldo uh, coming through the grades and he said, you know, the one thing or the one player that I, I remember watching come through the grades was Ronaldo Mulatalo and it was through his competitiveness, mm. just wanting to compete and wanting to, to be involved in the game, um, not necessarily the skill, but he said, that's what, that's what I look for in a player. And, you know, Ronaldo has certainly gone on with that and you can see why he's been successful is because of that competitive nature. Sharks are at home this week uh, on a Sunday afternoon game, a game that we'll be able to see on nine and nine now against the the, the Cowboys. We'll get to our matchups very soon for uh, the upcoming weekend, Billy. But that's a big that shapes a big game for for both clubs, doesn't it? That one. Yeah, the Cowboys looking to bounce back off that um uh, of that disappointing loss against the Eels. Uh, look, the Cowboys are a team, and, and both of these teams, Cowboys and Sharks, they can match it. With their attack, with the with the best of the, the teams in the competition, they, they they have scintillating attack. And to be honest, the Cowboys just need to find that balance. 
Um, the Sharks are probably looking for that balance. A couple of years ago, the, the Sharks were all out of tack, and now they're trying to, to balance their game. But, you know, the Cowboys, you know, when they're on, that they, uh, they scored a try. Scott Drinkwater scored a try on the weekend where it was – quite possibly the try of, of the year. It'll it'll go down as one of the candidates as, as try of the year. And um, they they score some wonderful tries. They, they've got some wonderful players in their team. They just need to find that balance of of when to open it up and pull the trigger with, mm. with their talent and when to play the percentage play. Um, I feel when they get that right, the Cowboys, um, they'll be... They'll be up there pushing for a premiership. Time now on the podcast to answer some of the listeners' questions. Okay, now, this one's from Roberto. Billy said, what did you make of Pappy's hip drop tackle on Friday night? There was no malice to it. Do you think a fine is sufficient? I I think a fine is exactly where it sits. Um, Look, when you hand down penalties to players... It's about bringing awareness to to not do it again, and and try and try and draw focus towards that area of the game to to try and clean up. Um, so I think a fine is perfect for this one because, as you say, th- th- there was no malice in it. Um, he was travelling at high speeds, which is which is uncommon for a hit drop. A lot of the hit drops are, are travelling travelling at low speeds, where mm. you know they're trying to pull a player down right at the end of the tackle. Um, this was, you know, a high speed sort of hip drop, and, and it was only there was there was no injury in it, which is which is great for Josh Adokar, and it was a lot of momentum in it. But at the same time, we we do need to be conscious of our body position when making tackles, and you know, it can be a really dangerous tackle. You know, we've we have seen injuries in the past, you know, with twisting your body and and coming down on on your hips. Um, so yeah, I think it sits in the right spot because of the fact that we just need to draw attention and focus in and around this, our body position when making tackles. And, and I think, uh, I think it was a $700 fine or something like that. Mm. That is totally sufficient. And I, I'm sure Ryan Pappenhausen probably doesn't even need a fine to actually know, okay, I need to be more cautious in that area. Yeah. Now, I was going to ask you this one from the top, but I saw it here, just proving to our wonderful producers that I do read the rundown. Uh, This one's from Mike. G'day, Billy. Did you see Pride of Jenny of the Queen Elizabeth Stakes on Saturday? Unbelievable. Never seen anything like it. That was freakish. Well, that's all I've seen. She was the only one I saw. (laughs) Actually, you couldn't even see her because the camera had to, to zoom out that far to get the whole field in so for, for the listeners the queen elizabeth stakes is a group one race in in the randwick championships up there uh, in sydney and um it's been dominated by the star mayor winks over the the you know recent years um but prior jenny is this this tough mayor that that loves leading and she's only worked it out over the last couple of years and and just won group one after group one and the, the field let her get away, I think it was like 30 or 40 lengths in front. Yeah. So we're talking like nearly 100 metres. That's a whole football field in front in a group one race. So with 600 metres to go in a 2,000 metre race, she's 30 metres in front, 30 lengths. So nearly mm. 100 metres in front um, with 600 to go. And she ended up winning by six or seven lengths. Um, it, was a, it was a great performance, but she is a tough horse. And how they let her get that far in front um, before they started reeling her in was was beyond me because the form was on the board with her. She had yep. been leading and she'd been winning races like that, not as magnified as that, but um, she'd been winning races like that for the last 18 months. So, yeah, well done to trainer Kieran Ma and jockey Declan Bates. Imagine if you get 30 lengths in front at Mooney Valley and a Cox Plate. That's like That's like being probably 40 points up in a grand final um, with maybe 15 to go. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. let them get that far in front. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Broncos. I didn't want to bring that. <laughs> That's why I said 40. Yeah, 40, not, not 16. <laughs> Send through your listener question. question. 16, 18. 18. Uh, 18. 18, something like that. Something anyway. in that vicinity. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to send your listener questions, email us at billyslaterpodcast at nine.com.au. Round seven coming up this week. We've got some 
Absolute ripping contest look forward to, including Roosters against the Storm. They always deliver these two teams. You played in plenty of great battles, uh, Billy, against the, the Roosters in your time at the Storm. I'm looking forward to this one. Thursday night at Allianz, this this will be a beauty. Um, yeah, the Roosters and the Storm, like you just have to have a look at the quality of players in both teams. Um, you know, Joey Manu ran for... 4,000 kilometers last week. Like he is an absolute freak. He just, he's always in the game. And what a luxury when, when your captain, uh, James Tedesco, goes down and has to sit out a week. You put Joey Manu back there and just delivers that performance. And they just got home against the Knights last week. And, you know, they'll be looking to, to double their wins up against the Melbourne Storm, who are sitting on top of the ladder. Uh, the Melbourne Storm are equal first with, with the Sharks. And, they just keep doing it. Craig Bellamy just has a way to do it. Two great coaches going head to head, two great clubs, two very proud clubs, and um, it's going to be a great battle on Thursday night. Hey, Panthers head to Bathurst to take on the Tigers. Uh, this was the game last year that the Tigers got a win over the Panthers. Yeah, I don't think that'll be happening this year, uh, although you would expect a, a bounce back factor for the Tigers. Benji Marshall was very honest, and I, I thought. I feel he's, he's, he speaks really well and really openly about where his team are at. Um, they get Lachlan Galvin back. Is Nathan Cleary back this week? Is he? Do you think he'll play with that hamstring or do you think they'll give it another week? Well, that's that's going to be the, the big yeah. question, isn't it, once 4 o'clock Tuesday comes around? Mm. Yeah. Um, so, look, oh, coming off the bye, I think the Panthers are going to be really fresh um, out there in Bathurst is is a pretty proud place for the Panthers. They love taking games out there um, and, and the Tigers as well. So, yeah, look, I, I, I'm going to go the Panthers purely because the Tigers were really disappointing yesterday. Off to Darwin, the Eels go. We're against the Dolphins. So Parramatta coming off a win. The Dolphins need to regroup after the, the loss against the Broncos. Okay, I'm going to say ball control is really important for any game, but in particular – in Darwin, it is it is so hot up there, and there's going to be so much sweat on the football, which is like a cake of soap at times. Um, now I've played in Darwin; it is ridiculously hot, and it's that's going to be a big element to this game. So, the team that holds the football will be the team that win the, win this game. Another one, too, just finally, we'll get your thoughts on Bulldogs v Knights. Uh, yeah, this is, again, uh, a, a big test for, for both teams coming off narrow losses. But, you know, Knights have got top eight aspirations and the Bulldogs just want to keep building, don't they? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an even contest. And, you know, we saw Kalen Ponga pick up a, a hip pointer injury. So it'd be interesting to see whether he's overcome that this week. Um, they can hang around for a little bit. You can get a bit of pain relief for for that sort of injury. And you, you saw right at the start of the game, they looked um, they looked in great form because of Kalen and, and the way that he injected himself into the game. Once he went down with injury, it changed the game until the pain relief kicked in. And then it, it saw him with an opportunity to win the game right at the end off of the back of Kalen Ponga. So, you know, their star fullback means so much to the Newcastle Knights, and if he's fully fit, I, I think they are too dangerous for the Bulldogs. But if he's not and he doesn't play, uh, this is going to play into the hands of the Dogs. Yeah, some interesting contests coming up for Round 7 of the National Rugby League after Round 6 was just uh, a beauty. So, Billy, you'll be uh, on deck on Thursday, no doubt? Thursday, Sunday this week. So, um, yeah, a couple of... Couple of beauties, all starting with the storm and the roosters. That's that's the one I'm looking forward to. All right, mate. Have a great week. Thanks, Salty. Enjoy. Thanks, Billy. This has been the Billy Slater Podcast. New episodes drop every Monday, and it's all thanks to Ram Trucks. Eats everything else for breakfast. This year, NRL on Nine is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast, get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And of course, my favourite, Freddie and the Ain. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.